Last time we talked about independence um, and solved some problems uh, using Bayes' rule, total probability theorem, um, conditional probability and independence. Today's topic is independent trials and binomial probabilities and counting. Okay, so let's consider um, n tosses, independent tosses of a coin with bias p. A coin with bias p comes up heads with probability p every time you toss and p is a number between 0 and 1. Okay, so the probability that it comes up tails is 1 minus p. These are independent repeated trials, meaning every time we toss the coin, the probability of getting heads is p. This is fixed. And successive trials do not affect each other. Okay, now let's answer this question together. What is the probability that we get k heads in a sequence of n tosses? How do we get k heads in a sequence of n tosses? Maybe let's first answer the question, what is the probability of the following sequence? Head, 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 k heads, followed by um, exactly n minus k tails. What is the probability of this sequence? E the probability of each head is p. The probability of each tail is 1 minus p. By independence, the probability that all of these events occur is the product of the probabilities. So p to the k times 1 minus p to the n minus k. Right? This, does everybody agree that this is the probability of getting this particular sequence? Okay. Now, we are interested in the event that there are k heads in a sequence of n tosses. Okay? This is a particular way that can happen, but there are other ways that this can happen. For example, we could get <coughs> tail, head, head. Okay, so this is po a possibility, right? n minus k minus 1 tails here, 1 tail in the beginning. The probability of, uh, the probability of this sequence and the probability of this sequence are equal, and they are both p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k. Any questions? Any problem? No? Okay. Now, how many such sequences are there composed of k heads and n minus k tails? Well, we need to pick, excuse me? Hmm. What are we doing? We need to pick places, pick locations, okay? Pick locations for k heads, okay, out of a total of n locations. So the first one, for the first h, how many choices are there? n choices, okay? So n choices for the first one, okay? And then, now that we place the first h somewhere, Okay, we have how many locations? We had n locations in the beginning. Now we place the h somewhere. We have n minus 1 locations left. So there are, for each such selection, there are n minus 1 choices left for the second h. And it goes like this, right? And minus two choices for the third, <coughs> etc. So, so how many possibilities? And choices for the first one, and minus one choices for the second one, and minus two choices for the second one, of uh, 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 third one, and <coughs> finally, 
n minus k minus 1 choices for the kth one. Right? So now another way of writing this, this is called the number of ways in which we can choose k objects out of k um, n objects, distinct objects. In other words, the number of ways in which we can choose k places out of n locations. It's read as n choose k. n choose k. Another way of expressing it is n factorial divided by what? n minus k factorial times k factorial. Okay? So I'm sure you already know a lot about these. This is just a reminder for many of you. Um, let's remind ourselves, how maybe you've never plotted this. Okay, so these are two plots of this expression, p to the k. Uh, I'm sorry, not this expression. Let, let's write uh, what, we're, uh, what we, um, the probability that we, are, uh, we set out to compute. The probability we set out to compute was the probability that um, k heads occur in and tosses, right? Now, each possible sequence like this is a distinct outcome. We can sum the probabilities of those, all those outcomes to find the probability of getting a sequence like that. Okay? How many sequences are there in that family? and choose k. What is the probability of each sequence? p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k. Okay? This is called the binomial distribution or the binomial probability law. Okay? In these figures, the binomial law is plotted for two different um, set of values. The top one is for n equals 7, so 7 tosses. p is 0 0.25, 1 over 4. Okay. Um, the plot starts at 0 and goes up to 7, right? Because, you know, the only legitimate values that k can take are from 0 to 7. You cannot get eight heads in a sequence of seven tosses, right? You cannot get, you can get zero, you cannot get negative. Uh, negative k is not possible. k bigger than seven is not possible. And if you look at these values, the, the heights of these bars are the values of the probabilities. Uh, the probability makes, makes a peak around one and two, okay? Now, let's look at the bottom figure. Here, n is 40. So 40 tosses. Again, the probability of heads is 1 over 4. Um, you, you can see that the curve got, you know, the bar chart got much smoother. It looks almost like a bell curve. Okay. Later on in the course, um, you will see a derivation, an actual derivation of um, how this curve converges to an actual Gaussian bell-shaped curve. It's too early now. But anyway, again, here numbers go from 0 to, values of k go from 0 to um, <coughs> 40, but um, you really don't see anything much after 20. Those numbers become unlikely. Okay. Uh, so any questions about this? Okay, so independent trials. Here's another problem related with independent trials. This is a generic digital communication problem. Uh, we'll do mm -hmm. more and more advanced versions of it as our probability knowledge grows in this class. So binary symmetric channel.
Here's the idea. Let's look at the figure first. Figure 1-3 depicts a binary symmetric channel where each symbol, 0 or 1 um, that is sent, is inverted with probability P0 independently of all other symbols. Here's the figure. If I send a 0, it gets turned into a 1 with probability P0 independently of all other previous symbols and all other previous inversions. If I send a 1, again, it gets inverted to a 0 with probability P0. So what is the probability that, I, that a 0 correctly gets, tr gets through? Huh? 1 minus P0. Uh, what is the probability that a 1 gets through? 1 minus P0. So every symbol that is sent gets across correctly with probability 1 minus P0 and is inverted with probability P0. Okay? That's our communication channel. The, there are very interesting questions to be asked in this channel. Can we communicate in this channel? At what rate can we communicate in this channel and how? Okay, these are very deep questions that are the topic of information theory. Uh, right now, let's start to answer a few maybe simple probability questions about this, which are on the, you know, the, really the basis of the information theoretic analysis of this channel. Okay, first things first. What is the probability that a string of length n is received correctly? Part A. String of length n. So, a sequence of ones and zeros of length n, n symbols. What is the probability that this is received with absolutely no error? Well, each bit is inverted independently, right? So again, we have independent trials like flipping coins and each bit is in error with probability P0 independently of others. So the probability that um, n bits are all correctly received is 1 minus P0 to the power n. 1 minus P0 times 1 minus P0 times 1 minus P0 n times. Okay. Any problem with this? No. Okay. What's the problem with this? Do you think? What is 1 minus P0? It's a number between 0 and 1. What happens as n grows? This, the probability that there is no error is going to 0 quite fast. And that's the problem. Okay. Once you have a non-zero error probability in a channel, okay, you have to do something to get your message across. That's called coding. <coughs> okay. um, <coughs> if you want error probability to go to zero. And there are ways of doing this. But anyway, so if you keep repeating, if this is your message, and if you want no errors in it, the probability of having no errors in it gets very small and goes to zero as your message grows. Okay? Um, that's true for every possible channel. Okay? So, <clears throat> now, given that a 100 zero zero is received, what is the probability that actually a 100 zero zero was sent? Okay, what's the probability that, you know, given that I got 110, what is the probability that a 100 zero zero was sent? Let's write that down. 1, 0, 0 was sent given that a 1, 1, 0 is received. What can we do? <clears throat> we, we are not given this probability directly. 
in the example. In the example, you know, we could answer, for example, what is the probability that if, if you send 1, 0, 0, what is the probability that they receive 1, 1, 0? We can answer this, right? But we're not given this, this one. So we can use Bayes' rule, maybe, to invert, <coughs> invert things. Right? So using Bayes' rule, this is the probability that 1, 0, 0 is, oh, I'm sorry, 1, 1, 0 is received <coughs> given that 1, 0, 0 is sent times the probability that 1, 0, 0 is sent divided by the probability of uh, 1, 1, 0 is received. 1, 1, 0 being received in general. Okay. Now, we need to compute the probability of 1, 1, 0 being received. Right. <clears throat> now, at this point, let's read this part of the question. Question says, first consider the case when ones, where ones and zeros are equally probable. Okay, so the source is putting out ones and zeros with probability to one half. Uh, and then consider the case when they're not pr equally probable. If they are equally probable, what is the probability of one zero zero being sent? One over eight, because each symbol is equally likely to be 1 or 0. So this would be 1 over 8. What is the probability that 1, 1, 0 is received? Again, 1 over 8 by symmetry. So this and this would cancel. And all we need to do is compute this. You see that? OK. Uh, but in general, in general, symbols may not be equally likely. Okay, so let's compute. Um, so suppose, suppose probability is uh, of sending a zero. Uh, let's call this um, um, P um, P one, and the probability of sending a one be P two. Okay then the probability of a 1, 0, 0, the sequence 1, 0, 0 being sent is what? Um, well, P2 times P1 squared. Right? A 1 followed by two zeros. Okay? What is the probability that a 1, 1, 0 is received? Hmm? Excuse me? What? Why do you think that's, that's true? Now, hmm, what is the probability that a 0 is received? Okay, let's compute that. A zero is received. A zero is received. If a zero is sent and it's not corrupted in the channel, or a one is sent and it's corrupted in the channel. Okay? So what is, let, let's write that probability. Um, a zero is sent, uh, received, if a zero is sent, which, is with, which happens with probability P1, and given that a zero is sent, it's not corrupted in the channel. Plus, a one is sent, and given that a one is sent, it is corrupted in the channel. Okay? So then, the, um, similarly, the probability uh, that a 1 is received 
is, you know, just the uh, opposite. A one is sent and it's not corrupted by the channel, plus a zero is sent and it is corrupted by the channel. Now, and you can compute, let's call this um, P uh, zero R, let's call this P one R. What is this probability then? P one R squared times P zero R. Okay? This is the general case. But let's now consider the easy case where symbols are equally probable to be zero and one. In fact, that's uh, almost always the case in real life. Mm, let P1 and P2 be one half. Okay. Then P um, um, probability that one zero zero is sent is one over eight and the probability that a one one zero is received is one half to the third power which is one over eight so um, so the probability uh, that we're looking for just depends on the probability of um, one one zero being received given one zero zero is sent. What is that probability? Now, one zero zero was sent. This zero is received correctly. This zero was inverted. And this one was received correctly. Okay, so the one is so basically, two of the symbols, this is the probability that two of the symbols are received correctly and one of the symbols is inverted. Okay? And that is the uh, probability we are looking for. Okay? In the special case where bits are zero or one equally probably. Okay. Any questions? Yes, please. Excuse me? We use Bayes rule. Okay, so we are trying to find the probability that uh, given that I received one one zero. What is the probability that they sent one zero zero? I used Bayes rule. Probability A given B, remember Bayes rule. P A given B equals P B given A times P of A divided by P of B. Okay? Do you remember this? Excuse me? When bits are equally probable, it's, it's quite easy. But I wanted to show you the other case, in the general case, so that you're not going to be misled. OK? Yes, please. Why not? Why don't you think it shouldn't? Why did Now, uh, okay, uh, what is the probability of receiving a one? Either I'll send a one, which happens with probability one half, and uh, it will uh, not get corrupted, which happens with probability <coughs> one minus zero, P zero, plus I send a zero, which probability one half, and it is corrupted. So. It's one half times one minus p zero plus one half times p zero. When you add them, you get one half. <coughs> oh, 
Okay. So why, why, why are we trying to answer this question? What is the significance of this question? That's the central problem of communication, right? In communication at the receiver side, you try to make out, you try to understand the message that was sent to you by someone far away, right? That's telecommunication. Um, you know, the, the, the transmitter, wherever it is, encoded its message in terms of bits and uh, your receiver received symbols that were possibly corrupted by the channel. Now from the potentially corrupted symbols that you receive, you're trying to infer uh, the likelihood of um, what was sent, okay? So that's the main question here. That, that's why we're interested in what is the probability that they meant this given that I received this, okay? And in the next part, I use a uh, majority decision rule to decide what was sent. So in part C, there's a very simple coding algorithm, extremely simple coding algorithm. In order to send a one, I repeat it three times. I send one, one, one. So to signal a one, I send one, one, one. To signal a zero, I send zero, zero, zero. And at the receiver, they decode by using a majority rule. Meaning, um, you, you look at a string of size 3. If there are m more 1s than zeros, you decide that it's a 1. If there are more zeros than 1s, you <coughs> decide that it's a 0. Okay? So in this um, case, what is the probability that a transmitted 1 is correctly de decoded? Okay, let's write that probability. The probability of decoding, deciding that it is a 1, given that a 1 was sent. Hmm. Now, if a 1 was sent, the symbols 1, 1, 1 were sent. It, it, they will be correctly decoded if and only if there are fewer than two errors in the channel. Fewer than two bits corrupted. Okay? So this is the probability of fewer than two errors given that 111 was set. Okay? Meaning either zero errors or one error. What is the probability of zero errors? One minus P zero cubed. Okay, all the symbols are correctly <coughs> received. Plus, what is the probability of exactly one error? One minus P zero squared times P zero. Is that it? No, times three. Remember the binomial law. There are three possible locations for the error. Okay? So this is the probability that a, a sent, a transmitted uh, one, which was encoded using this repetition coding mechanism, is correctly received. Yes, please. There is no three where? But this is different. So this, th you mean this expression? This expression is the probability that given I sent one, zero, zero, exactly this sequence, one, one, zero, is received. Okay? In this order. So one is received as one, zero is received as one, and zero is received as zero. In this case, when I send 
one, one, one. What are the cases for um, exactly one error? One, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero. Right? These are all included in the event of exactly one error. Okay. Now, this is the repetition coding scheme, and it's a very poor coding uh, method. Why do you think it's a poor coding method? Um, why are we doing this, by the way? We're doing this to reduce the probability of error. Okay. Previously, if I want to signal a 1, okay, think of a 1-bit message. Okay, you ask a question and you want the other side to answer yes or no. Okay? That's a 1-bit message. You're trying to get a 1-bit message correctly. Suppose it's very important for this 1-bit message to get across correctly. Okay? You know, think, substitute your favorite message. Okay. It's very important that it gets through correctly. What would you do to protect this one bit? One way that's suggested here is take the one and turn it into one, one, one. Or even extend this into one, 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 one. Okay, repeat this. Now, eventually, will you drive down the error probability to zero? Yes. At what cost? The cost is the rate of communication. Your rate of communication is one bit per many transmissions. Okay? What is the other cost? Energy. Your energy per bit is increasing like order n. n times the energy you use to signal one symbol. Now, this is a bad coding scheme in terms of rate and energy per bit. Can you think about a better coding scheme than this? Well, there is an answer to this um, in coding theory. Uh, and the answer is you should um, take longer and longer sequences longer on and longer messages and encode them into um, you know, even longer uh, blocks, code word blocks. Okay? So rather than send the one bit, try to send n bits at a time, but then encode them as a bigger sequence. Okay? And there are many ways of doing this. Uh, there are ways uh, known that can even achieve the capacity of this. And in fact, uh, by doing that, it's possible uh, to make error probability uh, approach zero uh, by transmitting at a finite energy per bit. Okay, in order to transmit at finite energy per bit, uh, you need to um, encode more and more bits over more and longer and longer blocks of symbols. Okay, so anyway. That's, that's the end of this example. Now, uh, let's briefly talk about counting. Uh, the previous um, example, the n choose k, that we computed in the binomial law was an example of counting. Okay? And there are many other ways of counting. Why do we care about count counting? Let's uh, remind ourselves. If you have a sample space where all outcomes are equally likely and you are trying to compute the probability of a, a particular event, all you have to do is to count the number of elements of that <coughs> event uh, and divide by the size of the sample space. Example. There are six balls in an urn, numbered one through six. If I draw randomly from this urn, what is the probability that the number on the ball drawn is divisible by three? P of A. What is P of A? Two over 
6, right? Because how many numbers are divisible by 3 is divisible by 3, 6 is divisible by 3, 2 over 6. Okay. So now, um, to count, there are several paradigms of counting. Let's go over them kind of quickly because I'm sure you remember this from your high school education, okay? So um, example A, permutations. The number of different ways of picking an ordered set of k elements out of n distinct objects, okay? Example, uh, you have numerals 1 through 9 and what um, are the number of distinct three-digit numbers that uh, um, you can form with no, where no uh, number is repeated, okay? What would the answer be? Permutation nine choose three, right? So now this is, um, Term, uh, well, k out of n distinct objects, order set of k out of n distinct objects. For, for the for, so basically we have k locations, k locations, let me write it this way, 1, 2, up to k. For the first location there are n choices. For the second location there are n minus 1 choices. For the kth location there are n minus k minus 1 choices, okay? So the number of permutations is n times n minus 1 times n minus k plus 1. Another way of writing this is n factorial divided by k factorial. Oh, wait, n minus k factorial, right? Okay, b combinations. Now, uh, we're choosing a group of k out of n distinct objects, but <coughs> the order in which order inside the group does not matter. So again, there is um, n factorial over n minus k factorial, but since the order of the k objects does not matter, we can divide this by the number of ways we can shuffle the k objects among themselves. So we get n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial, which is also written as n choose k. Okay, any questions here? Hmm? Now, next one, partitions. How many different ways of a set of size n can be partitioned into our disjoint subsets with the ith subset having size n i? Example, you have seven friends, seven friends, okay, they're all distinct people, but you will divide them into three groups, okay? One of them will be the captain of the team. One of them will be goalie, okay? Um, and five, the rest, the remaining five will be just players, okay? There is no ordering of the players among themselves. The ordering of the players does not matter. But who gets to be the captain matters. Who gets to be the um, goalie matters, okay? Right, so um, what it, you know, what are the number of ways? For the captain, there are seven choices. For the goalie, now that we picked the captain, there are six choices. For the remaining, well, out of five people, we pick five people. That's one. Okay, so in general, in general, out of n people, we pick n1 people for the first group. Then, out of the remaining n minus n1 people, we pick n2 people 
for the second group. Then out of n minus n1 minus n2 people, we pick n3 for the third group. And it goes like this until we pick <coughs> nr people for the final group out of nr people. What, what, import, what is important here? Um, the objects are all distinct. <coughs> for the objects, for each object, which group it falls into is important. But once it, it falls into a group, ordering inside the group is not relevant. Okay? That's, that's that. Um, Type D is something that perhaps you didn't see before. Some of you may have not seen this before. Distributing n identical objects into R boxes. Okay. Now, the objects are not distinct like this. They are identical. So all we care about is how many objects does each box get. Okay. So consider. Um, consider n identical balls, okay? And they're not numbered. And there are n of them. n of them. Okay? And we have r boxes. Okay? In each box, we can put 0 up to n uh, of the balls. Okay? But all together, will distribute these balls into the boxes. Okay, so for example, you know, box one can get one ball. Box two can get two balls. Box three, no balls. <coughs> and, you know, Box R can get this one ball, etc. Okay. So, how do we count the number of ways? A useful way of, and you know, visualization of counting the number of ways is to just to look at this picture. I draw uh, drew this picture on purpose. What do you see in this picture? You see balls and you see dividers. Okay, how many dividers? R minus one. R minus one dividers. Okay, divider one. Okay, divider one specifies box one. To the left of divider one, we have box one. To the left of divider two, we have box two between this divider and this divider. We need r minus 1 dividers for r boxes. Now, do you agree that every shuffling of r minus 1 dividers and r and balls gives us an organization of balls into boxes? Except the ordering of the balls among themselves is irrelevant, and the ordering of the dividers among that, I mean, we can switch this divider and this divider, they look identical, so nothing changes. So we should not overcount. So basically, n plus r minus 1 factorial is the number of ways we can shuffle dividers and ba balls, but in order to prevent overcounting, we need to divide it by the number of ways we can shuffle the balls among themselves, which is n factorial, and the number of ways in which we can um, shuffle the dividers among themselves, which is r minus 1 factorial. Okay? That's how we do that. Okay, let's quickly go over the following questions before we end. We have a number of examples. We'll really quickly go over them in the remaining one minute. 
categorize the following exa example with respect to the following two criteria. Is it sampling with or without replacement? And does ordering matter or not? First one, how many distinct words can you form by shuffling the letters of the word probability? Hmm. There are 11 letters there. Uh, there are 11 factorial ways of shuffling them. But now there are two Bs. Changing the Bs, uh, you know, um, exchanging the locations of the Bs or the, the two I's among themselves doesn't matter. So 11 factorial divided by 2 factorial, 2 factorial. Okay. Does ordering matter? This is with ordering, right? Um, and we are, when we sample a letter, we're not replacing it into the box. So without replacement. So this is a permutation example. B, as a result of a race with 100 entrants, how many possibilities for the gold, silver, and bronze medalists? Well, for the gold, there's 100 choices. For the bronze, uh, silver, now that we picked the gold medalist, now there are 99 choices for the silver. And now that we picked those two, there are 98 choices for the bronze. This is with ordering and without replacement. Um, part C. Choose a captain, goalie, and five players from a group of nine friends. We essentially did this. For the captain, we have nine choices. For the goalie, there are now eight choices. And for the five players, out of seven, we have five choices. Okay? And this is, this is without ordering, this part. But this part is with ordering, with no replacement. Um, choose a team of seven from among nine friends. Nine choose seven. Right? Notice that this is the same as choosing the two people that you leave out of the group. So this should be equal to 9 choose 2. Um, OK. With no ordering, with no replacement. Part E. How many possible car plate numbers are there in Ankara? Assume two or three letters and two or three digits. OK, so <coughs> letters, <coughs> digits, two or three letters. Hmm. We can think of three locations for the letters, three locations for the digits. For the first location, we have 23, 23 choices. For the second location, 23 choices. For the third, we can either choose a letter or not choose a letter. OK, that makes 24 choices. Now for the digits, again, 9, 9, 10. OK? This is with replacement because you can reuse a letter and with ordering. Let's do part F. Now. <coughs> I can use the numbers 0, 1, and 9 arbitrarily many times. So there is um, repetition. To form a sequence of length 8, how many possibilities are there for the sum of all numbers in my sequence? So I'll form a sequence of length 8 of numbers that are zeros, ones, and nines. The sum of all the numbers gives me the weight of this uh, sequence. So n0 is the number of zeros, n1 is the number of ones, and n9 is the number of nines. And the numbers of these 
add up to eight. <coughs> okay. How many solutions for this? Let's see, what kind of counting is this? I have my eight. locations, okay, if you want eight balls, some of the balls I put into the zero box, some of the balls I put into the one box, so, and the remaining balls are put into the nine box, right? That shows me um, zero is selected, zero box zero is selected and zero times, box one is selected and one times, box nine is selected and nine times. So the number of ways this can happen, as we showed in um, type D counting, with replacement, without ordering, that is um, what? 8 plus 3 minus 1 factorial divided by 8 factorial 3 minus 1 factorial. Why? Because n is 8 and r is 3. Okay? And finally, part g, find the number of solutions of the equation x1 plus x2 plus xr equals n, where n and all the xi's are positive integers. Okay? Think about this example. This is exactly the same with some uh, replacement, without ordering. And I'll give you the answer. The answer is n plus r minus 1 factorial divided by n factorial r minus 1 factorial. Okay? Uh, but think, think about why. And uh, as a hint, you can think of the number n as the sum of n ones, okay, and you're distributing these ones to these locations, variables, x1, x2, in different ways. Okay, I'll see you next time.